Okay, so we're currently in the second week of a four-week series on the Book of Ruth. And we're going to be looking at one of the four chapters each week throughout the series. Now, last week uh, we explored chapter one, in which we were introduced to Naomi and Ruth, uh, two of the central characters in this story. And we learned a few things from this first chapter that set the scene for the whole story. So firstly, we were told that this story was set in the days of the judges. And in fact, that's the very first line in the book that we hear. And this is a really important thing to note because it gives us context to understand the significance of a lot of the things that are going to happen in this book. Because the time of the judges was seen as a pretty awful time in the history of Israel with lots of corruption and lots of evil acts. So, oh, it was a time of selfishness, of chaos, hatred, and things that weren't of God. Um, and, and so as a reader of Ruth, we're really expected to have an understanding of what it means when they say it's set in the time of the judges and potentially not have very high hopes for what's going to happen in this story. But surprisingly in Ruth, what we find is a story of hope and promise in the midst of this dark time. So instead of acts of selfishness, we read of acts of selflessness, of kindness, generosity and of love for others. We see in Ruth that even during this awful period of time, God has still preserved some good and that all is not lost. And this is significant because at the very end of the book, we come to learn that Ruth is actually the great grandmother of King David, who we now know sits in the lineage of Jesus. So this story is an important precursor to many of the great events that are going to happen in the Bible. And it shows us that God's line is not preserved by heroic feats of military might, but by acts of love and kindness. Now there's a word that appears in each of the first three chapters of the book of Ruth. Um, and it really epitomizes what this story is about. Now you might be familiar with it if you were here last week because Richard introduced us to it. It's the word hesed. And um, just to, to, to put it out there, I know I'm not pronouncing that right, but if you want to hear the correct pronunciation, chat to Len after the service. <laughs> um, but we're going to say hesed um, for the purposes of this sermon. Um, and the interesting thing about this word is that there's no direct English translation for it. So it's often written as the word kindness um, it, it, in its translation into English form, but there's a, a much greater depth of meaning behind the word. Um, and so really, hesed is about this loyal love. It's about covenant faithfulness. It's about acting on behalf of someone else in need. And it's for doing it for, for no reason other than to love that other person. There's no, it's not an earned love. It's about grace and generosity and sacrifice. And it's the demonstration of this love, this hesed, that, uh, by Ruth and Boaz in chapter 2 that I want to explore with you um, today. But first, let's have a quick recap of what's happened so far in the story. So, chapter 1, we were told of a lady named Naomi. We were told of her husband, Elimelech, and her two sons. And we know that there was a famine in the land um, where they lived in Bethlehem, Judah. So they chose to move to Moab, which is the neighboring country. And um, while they're in Moab, which is about 10 years in total, uh, the two sons marry Moabite women, Ruth and Orpah. Uh, but while they're there, tragedy strikes and Naomi's husband, Elimelech, and the, the two sons, so the husbands of Ruth and Orpah die. And this leaves the three women all alone in Moab. Now, as we know, it was really difficult for women to live alone in the patriarchal society of the ancient world, um, especially those like Naomi who were older and barren and didn't really have any hopes of remarriage. So in order to try to get some more support, Naomi says, okay, I'm gonna go back to Bethlehem in Judah. Um, you know, where there's, uh, she's heard that there's no famine anymore and she's got family there. 
Um, but her daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, they're young, they still have prospects for remarriage. So Naomi says to them, look, you should go back to your family um, in Moab where you will be supported and you can get remarried and start a new life. Now they both protest strongly against this, uh, but eventually Orpah does agree to go back to her family. But Ruth, Ruth says, no, I'm not leaving you, Naomi. You know, no matter what, I'm going to stick with you. Um, she can't be convinced. So together they set off for Naomi's hometown in Judah, in Bethlehem. And that's where we're up to. So already we've heard this tale of sacrificial love, this act of hesed, in Ruth essentially giving up prospects of another marriage and potential children and sticking by Naomi, no matter what that might mean for her. Not only does this contrast greatly with the selfishness of the time of the judges, but it's also the first of several acts in this book where we see God's love reflected in human form. So where human love reflects the love of the divine, which is the theme that we're running with throughout this series. So Ruth and Naomi, they've just returned to Bethlehem. It's the time of the harvest. And as they're widowed, they need to find a way to support themselves. Now, presumably, since Naomi has chosen to return here, she knows that she could potentially have found some kind of limited support um, with some family member. You know, it's not going to be an easy life, but potentially she's going to be able to find something to support her, at least enough to keep her alive and Ruth. But it seems that Ruth's determined to do whatever she can to help Naomi and not to simply rely on others, but to provide for Naomi, which we know is very much not the expectation of a female at this time. So Ruth heads out to glean from the fields, which means she's going to go and collect the leftover grain from the harvest. Now this gleaning was uh, a well-known uh, thing at the time. It was actually a written law in the Torah, and there was two places in the Torah that it decreed um, this thing. So that harvesters in their field, they would have to leave um, a perimeter of wheat around the edge of their field, um, and also not collect any grain that was dropped from the harvest. And this was so that the poor and the alien, so the foreigner, would have a means of collecting food. It was basically the ancient form of social welfare. So when Ruth headed out into the fields to glean, she was partaking in a well-known and accepted task, but it was in no way an easy task. In fact, when we stop to consider her situation for a moment, we realise just how impressive this action really was. Because Ruth was someone who was disadvantaged in almost every way that mattered in the ancient Near East. So for starters, she was a foreigner in a pagan land that throughout history had held hostile relations with the Israelites. And everything about her, from her physical appearance to her dress to her accent, would have made this abundantly clear to people. So she had this potential hostility to deal with. And although she had accepted Yahweh as her God, she was a religious outsider and many would have viewed her as such. She had no husband, no sons, no family connections. And when we think about the fact that she had potentially been married for up to 10 years and still hadn't produced children, potentially prospects of a future marriage might have been unlikely for her. As a single woman, she would have lived in constant fear of being assaulted. That was the reality at the time. Um, it was not uncommon. And to top it all off, she was living with a lady, with Naomi, who had essentially given up on hope. She'd given up on her life, on her worth, and we're told at the end of the last chapter that she'd even changed her name to Mara, which means bitter. So emotionally, Ruth would really have had a lot to deal with. So the fact that she went to work in the fields despite all of this demonstrates a huge amount of courage and resilience. Ruth was a strong woman. And when we read the book of Ruth, I think it's important for us to recognise this fact. Because we can often get caught up in the Cinderella story of Ruth. 
seeing her as this perfect, obedient, you know, virtuous young lady who was rewarded for her faithfulness by meeting Boaz. You know, the Prince Charming that comes to her rescue. At least, I know, I don't know about you, but that's the version that I've read in novels. That's the version that I've seen often in Bible studies and in devotionals. This idea that Ruth is somehow redeemed or saved by Boaz. That Ru Ruth represents us and Boaz represents God. And on the surface value, you know, that's not... That's a nice way to look at it. That's a good message to get out of the story. But the more I think about that, the more I realise that this understanding does a real disservice to Ruth and to our understanding of how a woman is valued in society. Yes, we are all in need of, of saving by God. That's not, that's not what, I'm, what I'm saying here. What I'm saying is that in using this story as a metaphor for God's redemption, with Ruth as us and Boaz as God, that there's a danger that we forget that Ruth plays an integral role in this story in her own right, independent of Boaz's actions. Because the truth is that Ruth was not some helpless person that needed to be rescued. Remember, she didn't just sit back with Naomi and rely on others. She stepped up as the provider for Naomi nor was she some quiet, obedient young lady who stayed within the lines of what was deemed socially acceptable. Ruth was brave, Ruth was courageous, and she wasn't afraid to act with boldness. And we see Ruth showing bold determination throughout the whole of this book. Ruth is not afraid to break the mold and go beyond what is expected or accepted of her to demonstrate her loyalty and love for Naomi. In fact, she's not at all afraid to break the mold of societal expectations. So think about it. In a culture that told people to <clears throat> stick to their own ethnic groups, um, she breaks the mold. She follows Naomi into a foreign land with foreign gods, with foreign customs. In a culture that told people to obey their elders, she refuses Naomi's command. She goes with her despite her protests. In a culture that told women to commit themselves to men and to allow men to be the providers, she takes matters into her own hands. She says, no, I've got this. I'm not going to abandon Naomi just because that's what it, what's expected of me. And you know what I love is that we see this defiant spirit passed down the line all the way to Jesus. Because when we think about it, Jesus wasn't afraid to break the mold either. If it meant doing what it was that God wanted. As a boy, we hear he left his parents without telling them where he was going so that he could go spend time in the temple. As an adult, he ate with those deemed to be sinners, with the socially marginalised, with the ritually unclean. He was in constant argument with the rulers of the day and he even destroyed the, the tables, the stalls from those profiting from the temple. Just like Jesus, Ruth shows us that we can and we should stand up for who we love and who God loves, no matter what people think. She shows us that we should do whatever it takes, above and beyond what is expected of us, to care for others. And for some of us, like Ruth, this may manifest itself in the form of bold justice, in acts that speak out, that challenge the status quo, and that put human needs above tradition and formalities. But Ruth is not the only person in this story who demonstrates God's hesed, God's loving kindness. This chapter also introduces us to Boaz, who still demonstrates this loving kindness, but in a slightly different way. So we're told that Boaz was the owner of the field that Ruth goes to glean in. And we're told that he was a relative of Naomi and that he was a powerful and wealthy man. But we also know that this story was set in a time where lawlessness reigned and where everyone was doing what was in their own best interests. 
So it's with a, a fair bit of apprehension that we read on in the story here, wondering what is going to happen. You know, how's Boaz actually going to treat Ruth when he finds her in his fields? But surprisingly, we find a man of God who greets his harvesters with God's blessing and shows genuine care for them and for Ruth. And the interesting thing here is that Boaz doesn't just act reasonably or fairly towards Ruth. He also goes above and beyond what is expected of him. So again, let's look. So potentially, he could have driven her out of his field for being a foreigner. Reasonably, a reasonable action would have been to let her stay in the field, you know, and go about her business. But what he says to her is that you should stay in my field and glean here exclusively so that you will be cared for and looked after. Instead of taking advantage of Ruth, again, a distinct possibility at this time, or again, just leaving her untouched, unharmed, he actually goes and tells his men not to touch her, not to harm her, and for her to stay with the women so that she will be protected. And lastly, he could have withheld grain from her, you know, not wanting anyone to come and take the grain from his field, even though it was a law at the time, but we know people were breaking those laws. Um, a reasonable action would have been to allow her to come in and collect what she could, just as per the law. But what he does is he feeds her more than she needs. We're actually told that it, she couldn't eat all that he fed him. And um, puts out excess grain and tells his men not to reprimand her for taking it. So do you notice this common theme again? Although Boaz shows his loving kindness to others through generosity and grace, as opposed to Ruth's courage and determination, he too goes above and beyond what's expected of him choosing to ignore prejudices that treated foreigners poorly or said that men could disrespect women or treat others however it wanted if it benefited them. He intentionally acts in a way that he knows God would want him to live, no matter what people might think of him. I wonder which character you relate to most in this story. For many of us, it might be Ruth who faces many struggles and challenges along the way, yet still shows God's love through determination and loyalty. For others of us, it might be Boaz, who has abundant resources and lives in relative wealth and comfort, yet acts with overflowing generosity and grace. For others of us, it might be both. It may change throughout our lives. But what I invite you to ask yourself is, how can you use your personal circumstances to show hesed to others? How can you demonstrate God's loyal, selfless love in a society that says we should put ourselves first and care for others second? How can you go above and beyond what is expected of you to show loyalty and kindness and grace and generosity in your day-to-day -day lives? In essence, how can you love better? And the answer might not be simple, it might not be obvious. Because when we consider this story, we see that neither Ruth nor Boaz took the simple option. Sim not, they didn't take the simple path, but both of them chose to act with love towards others. Not for any personal gain, it should be noted, or for any sense of duty, or for any reason other than they cared about someone else's well-being because God cares about our well-being. Imagine what the world would be like if we all acted with that kind of selflessness in our day-to-day -day lives. One more thing I just want to quickly note, and you might remember this from the Bible Project video if you watched it last week, is that I wonder if you notice that nowhere in this chapter, or in fact in most of the book, are we told that God is directly involved. We don't hear the narrator tell us that God did this or God told Ruth to go there or told Boaz to treat Ruth in this way. And I think this is really significant because it emphasises the importance of our own human actions and our choices. Yes, God can intervene, 
And of course, it's obvious as we read this story that God's providential hand is at work here. Naomi even acknowledges that God's looked favorably on them. But ultimately, it's Ruth and Boaz who are responsible for how they choose to act and how they choose to reflect the love of God in the world that they live. And likewise, it's our responsibility to use what we have, whether it be courage, determination, generosity, or overwhelming grace to show God's love to others. I've got a video that I'd like to show you to wrap up. And after that, I just invite you to take a bit of time of personal prayer and reflection. What if we could love the way Jesus did? Passionately, faithfully, powerfully. What if the way we love could make a difference in the world around us? What if that love looked at everyone the way God does? A love which doesn't see the past, but is consumed by a desire to see people come to know Jesus. A love which is patient and kind, not envious or prideful. A love which puts others before ourselves, chooses peace over anger. A love which protects, trusts, hopes, perseveres. Do we love like this? Do we love like Jesus? Maybe it's time to ask a simple question. How can we love better?